I am uh, delighted to in, uh, to introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, Bill Overholt. I am only going to highlight one aspect of his uh, many faceted career as an observer of Asian uh, political economy. And that is that he was the first person I am aware of to raise the possibility that on any metric, purchasing power parity, whatever, the Chinese economy would come to match in scale uh, the US uh, economy. That was in the very early uh, 1990s, at which point it was generally regarded as a bizarre and unlikely observation. He proved to be right about that, and he has over the years proven to be right about uh, many other things. He brings a unique uh, combination of a business perspective, a political perspective, and an economic uh, perspective. His preoccupation for the last year or so has been China's uh, economic prospects or lack thereof. And he is going to tell us today about China's future. Bill Overholt. Thank you, Larry. I want to stand up because I like to see who I'm talking to. Uh, yeah, that book, a 1992 book, it's called The Rise of China, How Economic Reform is Creating a New Superpower. Uh, four years ago, I published a book called China's Crisis of Success that said they were heading into a new era. Uh, the first book sold a lot of copies despite the bad reviews. So I'm still known as the China Bull. I, I discovered the University of Pennsylvania is having a conference next year. Uh, and the theme is who's right, overhauled the China bull or some of the skeptics. Um, uh, the prediction of becoming a superpower happened. It's done, we're now in a new era. Um, uh, let me begin by summarizing my theme today and that's that Xi Jinping is not going to enjoy his third term. Uh, let me start by looking at the economic prospects and then at the political prospects. There's some very common views on the economic prospects. Almost all the national security people say, oh, China's proved to be very good at growth. So obviously for the rest of history, they're gonna go grow faster than the US and they're gonna overwhelm us. Uh, that's not nuanced economic argument. There's an opposite argument that autocracies cannot sustain economic growth and China's an autocracy. And we're told that autocracies can't promote officials by merit they can't do long range plans. Uh, in general, they can't sustain economic growth. Uh, this argument is a triumph of modern political economy. You take a completely incoherent conceptualization, you had two logical fallacies, and then you run a regression on an invalid database and you come up with the wrong conclusion. I'll be happy to talk about more about that if somebody triggers me in the question session, but I'm here to talk about China. So uh, what are the prospects of the Chinese economy? Well, after 2030, pretty slow. Uh, I'm not talking here about the current property and COVID downtown, downturn. Uh, China will manage that. It will bounce back to some extent but later, things get more difficult. Uh, China's rapid growth has largely been based on three drivers, property, infrastructure, and urbanization. 
And those have been great drivers, but by the end of this decade, they're pretty much worn out. They're used up. And property property has already peaked and the bubble's bursting, and that's uh, being managed partly by inflating an infrastructure bubble. These driver downturns are being worsened by uh, two other problems. Uh, China will continue for a very long time to have to service the debts that it ran up and, and building all this property and, and the infrastructure bubble. But above all, an aging population will become, is becoming a huge economic burden. And that burden is borne by a rapidly declining total workforce. A weakened private sector provides 90% of urban employment, 100% of net job creation, over half of all exports, and according to Luha, 70% of all innovation. Under Xi Jinping, uh, private sector investment and credit growth have declined quite sharply. While the big private companies are taking market share away from the big state enterprises, the sector as a whole uh, is not. The big banks can't do credit worthy lending to local companies, which is where the entrepreneurial private sector companies are. I'm an old banker, so I'll, again, you can ask me a question about that. Xi Jinping's overdone reform of shadow banking eliminated most of the institutions that could do that lending. And the, the internet platform companies like Ant Financial had a potential solution, uh, but Xi Jinping was very worried about their political clout, uh, about their control of data. Uh, so the government grabbed control of the data and turned them over to the big state banks. Uh, can the big state banks uh, use those the way Ant Financial did? I think it's going to be like a merger of Twitter and Tesla. Um, Xi Jinping is not trying to curtail the private sector, but he is trying to strengthen the, the state sector. This forces one to ask, uh, will China experience Japanification? Now, Japanification is where the economy is dominated by a bunch of big conglomerates in cahoots with the government that thinks the way to drive the economy is to protect those conglomerates and, and tell them how to move forward. Uh, Japan's, I mean, China's big companies are more dynamic and more competitive, more diverse than Japan's. But there are two fundamental lessons from the Japan experience. One is that this kind of industrial policy, the government's trying to tell its big companies how to become leaders in every sector of modern industry. It typically has some huge successes that are very expensive and even more failures that are very expensive. Uh, so this is a very expensive way to do business. Uh, second, when Japan started creating its own standards to protect its own companies, for instance, protect the cell phone companies from Motorola, it, its cell phone companies got complete control of the Japan market, but Japan turned over the world market to uh, Apple and Samsung. China is at risk of doing that. It has to sell much of the world on its standards or it'll end up with the Japan problem. Um, turn to services. Services are the dominant sector of any modern economy. Uh, China's economy has been more than half services 
since uh, 2015, and uh, that percentage has, has grown ever since. But the modern services sector, uh, finance, law, accounting, journalism, uh, much of education has been much more protected than the industrial sector. If you're an industrial company in China, you've had to compete with the best Europeans, uh, Americans, and Japanese. But if you're if you're an accounting company, no. So the services sector tends to be stodgy uh, and quite corrupt. Uh, it's going to be more difficult for China to move forward in some areas like uh, finance. There's sl slow movement, uh, but overall they're looking inward. So this. This could be an opportunity for China to grow like crazy in a new sector, or it can be a drag. The way it's going, it's a drag. Uh, the breadth of Chinese growth the past 30 years uh, owes a lot to an entrepreneurial bureaucracy. Early in the reform era, the leadership basically tried to take this huge bureaucracy and turn it into Drexel Burnham with Chinese characteristics. How did they do that? They took away a lot of the fiscal support. So local governments didn't have the money they needed to do the jobs they were required to do, but they allowed them to go into business. Immediately, there were 110 million jobs in the town and village enterprises. The Institute of Marxism Leninism turned itself into a consulting firm. Uh, teachers, primary school teachers, gave each kid six eggs and taught them how to raise chickens to support the school and teacher salaries. Uh, so you've got a, an extraordinarily entrepreneurial bureaucracy. The entrepreneurship worked because very meritocratic goals were assigned. Everybody knew what they had to do to, to get promoted. But not too many questions were asked. If you achieve your goals, not too many questions were asked about how you did it. So this was a great recipe for entrepreneurship, uh, for corruption, and for risky finance. Again, Drexel Burnham. Uh, Xi Jinping's crackdown on corruption terminates that era. Uh, everybody is afraid to do anything. If you bend the rules in any way, somebody can along, come along and accuse you of corruption. In the New York subway system, when the workers are unhappy and they wanna shut the system down, they have what they call a work to rule. You obey every rule. And that just shuts everything down. Um, what's happened with the anti-corruption campaign is we've gone from Drexel Burnham with Chinese characteristics to a work to rule. Uh, the system is, is seizing up. The least of China's problems is the activation of party committees in every business, public and private, as the ultimate arbiter of business strategy. Uh, we don't really know how this works across the economy. I suspect it works very differently in different regions and different sectors. We do know that in many of the big Beijing-based companies, basically our only source of information, that the agenda of the party secretary is very different from the agenda of the CEO. In Guangdong, maybe the CEO just buys off the party secretary. That's great variation. So we don't know whether this is gonna be a lot of sand in the gears or a little sand in the gears, but it's sand in the gears. 
Uh, finally, uh, foreign investors who've been crucial are going to be a lot more careful going forward about how much they invest and what they invest. Uh, aside from overall economic growth, there's been a, an unsettling budget transition. Uh, at the turn of the century, the economy grew 10% a year and government revenues grew, grew twice that because the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese economy was just coming in to the monetary economy and tax collection was improving. Now growth is four or 5% and GDP growth and revenue growth have to converge. Uh, they can't, revenue growth can't keep growing at twice the rate forever. So when Xi Jinping took office a decade ago, it was a bull market mentality. China could do everything. It, it could have a trillion dollar belt and road. It could pay for an aging society. It could provide social services to everybody. It could grow a military uh, to compete with the United States and on and on. Uh, last few years, sobriety has been setting in and the sobriety set in very sharply this year. That sobriety coincides with a new politics. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that Xi Jinping is the most powerful leader since Mao Zedong, and uh, he can do just about anything he wants to do. Uh, that's nonsense, but before I get to that, let me provide a little context. Uh, leader's greatest task throughout Chinese history has been to, to create stability out of chaos. Mao Zedong unified the country and most Chinese revere him for that. Despite privations, starvation, millions of deaths, that was the important task and he did it. But into the 1990s, the government still was unable to perform many of the basic functions of government. Uh, under Zhu Rongji and Jiang Zemin, for the first time it became capable of doing things like controlling the money supply, uh, bringing inflation down, uh, moving, removing a provincial governor, moving a senior general from one province to another. That was new under Jiang Zemin. Uh, but the, 20, the 21st century brought some retrogression. Under Hu Jintao, uh, Ministers often uh, uh, ignored the prime minister and uh, private sector leaders often derided the prime minister's edicts. Uh, local governments didn't obey the central government. Uh, private companies dominated growth uh, and some of them were becoming very powerful in it and assertive, uh, corruption was everywhere. Demonstrations rose by an order of magnitude tenfold uh, during this period. Uh, finally, when, when they got from 20,000 to about 180,000 a year, uh, the government stopped publishing the statistics. Uh, Marxism was becoming a boring class required of reluctant students. Uh, party membership was opportunistic. Communist party leadership seemed to the leaders of that party to be in very serious danger. Uh, faced, faced with this, Hu Jintao, who was crippled by di diabetes and committed to collective leadership, uh, vacillated. This backsliding reflected a, a weak leader and a very corrupt uh, prime minister's family 
But more fundamentally, it reflected a, a more complex society. As economic growth succeeds, you go from peasants and road builders and socks manufacturers to 100 different kinds of software, uh, unimaginable complexity. And in other Asian countries, when they got to that point, they, they faced a fundamental economic and political challenge. South Korea and Taiwan responded to that challenge by saying, oh, we've got to move toward a more market-oriented economy and a more market-directed politics. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping's mandate was to resolve this crisis of complexity. And, and, and by the way, I, I wrote a book four years ago called China's Crisis of Success, where I said, this is what's gonna happen. Uh, his job was restore order, restore central control, reignite economic reform, save the party. Uh, people in the West didn't really understand that the party felt 10 years ago that it needed saving. But Xi Jinping talked about that in his recent big speech. Uh, this immense assignment seemed disproportionate to Xi Jinping's very narrow political base. Uh, that narrow base made his peers think that he would be controllable. It didn't turn out that way. And despite a narrow political base, uh, Xi Jinping did not vacillate. Corruption had to be conquered, potential challengers routed, civil society atomized, government and economy centralized, party control rendered absolute, Marxism reimposed, regrettable history erased, nationalism inflamed, foreign ideas filtered. The threat was omnipresent, corruption everywhere, civil society and cosmopolitan ideas everywhere, personal vulnerabilities very raw. So C. Dutt sought personal control of everything. His multiple titles put him in charge of the government, the party, the military, and eight small leading groups uh, that manage everything from economic reform to basic economic and financial management, uh, internet security and informatization, military reform, national security coordination. Uh, with remarkable efficacy, he banished all challengers. He broke established norms such as the two term limit and the requirement to groom successor. He wrote himself into China's constitution. This is what leads it, everybody said, oh, this is the most powerful guy since Mao. But numerous titles and suppressed opposition do not evidence, confident, absolute power. She is accountable to the Communist Party, unlike Putin, whose party is just a, a way of channeling more power and money to him. From another perspective, imagine the head of uh, an American conglomerate who makes himself CEO and CFO and CTO and the head of every operating division. Uh, would the Wall Street Journal write that this was a, a confident, uh, uh, capable chief executive? No, they'd write, lacked confidence, insecure, didn't know how to delegate. In contrast, Deng Xiaoping could have destroyed his ideological opponent, Deng Lijun. He could have destroyed his reform opponent, Shen Yun, but uh, he was wise enough not to do that. Under Jiang Zemin, one of the bases of reform success 
was that he balanced the conservatively pay and reformist Jurangji, diverse viewpoints. You want the ultimate confident leader in control. Look at Deng Xiaoping in his final years. He was CEO of China based on one title, honorary chairman of the Chinese Bridge Players Society. Uh, uh, to assert central and specifically party authority to attack corruption and to acquire the clout to impose his will on the economy, Xi Jinping took on every elite group at the same time. The anti-corruption uh, campaign jailed more than 100,000 figures, many of them quite senior, some 14 million were investigated. State enterprise leaders lost half of their compensation. Private sector credit and investment collapsed. Giant conglomerates disintegrated. Tech sector executives and investors lost $2 trillion in the recent uh, uh, tech reform and green energy executives, just the executives in charge of companies, lost 140 billion in a, in a few weeks. Provincial and local leaders have found their jurisdictions in a financial squeeze and their personal compensation uh, seriously cut. Having been known for their entrepreneurial energy early, earlier, now they're demoralized, unhappy, immobilized. Crackdown on companies hurt the bankers to those companies. These reforms decimated the shadow banking sector, which should become very important. Uh, to demolish any uh, potential civil society problems, she repressed teachers, tutors, lawyers, journalists, feminists, homosexuals, Christians, Muslims, Falun Gong, NGOs. This creates a lot of enemies. Now, the model of how you do a uh, big reform and stay in power is uh, Turkey's Ataturk. You form a coalition, you reform those guys. Then you form another coalition, you form those guys. That way you've always got a big group on your side. It's very risky to take on almost every elite at the same time. Now, Xi Jinping has this enormous uh, public base of support. It's twice the size of Trump's, twice the percentage of Trump's uh, base. And there's a lot of the elite that says, thank God you saved the party. But there's just enormous elite unhappiness spread across all major sectors of, of, of Chinese society. A feeling that uh, maybe she's taking them back to the past, not forward to the future. Uh, she's control of propaganda, the security apparatus, the party, economic management, ensure that he can maintain mass support for the for the five years. Uh, he's good for his third term. Uh, nonetheless, his actual ability to get stuff done is at risk. Successful pushback has limited further internet platform reforms. The umbrella phrase for his social goals, common prosperity, barely made it into recent uh, publications. Belt and Road Initiative, primary foreign policy initiative 
been downplayed and budgets cut way back. Propaganda organs have been pushing Russian propaganda very hard about Ukraine. <coughs> but from May on, the majority of WeChat uh, posters have been pro-Ukraine. So there's some limits out there. <coughs> she, she spent so much of his first two terms consolidating power that he had to push a lot of his desired accomplishments into year 10. Uh, year 10 has not been a good year. Uh, Xi's protectionism against Western vaccines deprived Chinese of effective access uh, to good vaccines and necessitated lockdowns of hundreds of millions of people. With the lockdowns and the property bubble bursting as catalysts, uh, the once triumphal mood in China has has changed very dramatically in this calendar year. Uh, the mood going into this year was like Dick Cheney and George W. Bush in 2001. History is over. We're going to impose our system everywhere. Um, that went away for us. Uh, it's just diminished. Uh, greatly in China. Uh, they still think we're declining. Uh, they have interesting arguments for that, but they're not so sure that that their leadership is in, infallible anymore. Well, China's 2013 excitement over a new era of reform, the market was going to be the determinant of the economy. Uh, uh, political unity was going to be re re reinvigorated. Corruption was going to be eliminated. Uh, it's become a kind of grim doubling, doubling down on zero COVID, Russia policy, infrastructure overinvestment, and propping up the housing market by further inflating the infrastructure bubble. Implementing common prosperity would require a property tax, an inheritance tax, highly progressive income taxes and abandonment of Hugo controls on movement between parts of China. Some of that will happen, but there's intense resistance. Who are the property owners? Well, they're the, the big leaders of the Communist Party. I've been trying to implement an experiment on property taxes for 11 years and haven't succeeded. So Joe Biden and in dealing with inequality, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping have a lot in common. Uh, not, notwithstanding a fierce campaign against corruption, this hierarchical politics and highly status economy will, will grow corruption the way a, a wet log grows mushrooms. New policies will have to pass through layer after layer after layer of officials resentful of reduced pay and reduced authority. The Xi Jinping will not be a lame duck, but he's gonna be a slow duck. Uh, let's step back. While all Chinese want China to be a rich and powerful global leader, uh, Xi's domestic and foreign policies are not the inexorable culmination of a decades long plan to do things this way. You get, you get a lot of that, that kind of story out of Washington. No, so a lot of other things, no relationship to reality. This extreme repression is a very sharp break from previous trends. His Hong Kong and Xinjiang policies are a very sharp break from what previous leaders intended. His economic policies reverse a lot of his predecessors' moves, promoting openness, market orientation, and diverse competition. Since 1949, each, each leader 
as remedying the most serious faults of his predecessor. Uh, it's been remarkable how this generational change every 10 years has corrected. It's what a democratic system is, is supposed to do by throwing out the old guys and bringing in new ones. Uh, it's worked very well in China. Uh, but Xi Jinping has broken that that norm of change every decade. Uh, that doesn't mean the possibility of change in the future has been eliminated. Uh, because Xi's core policies seek to push back the tide of social complexity uh, and the globalization of knowledge, that tide keeps coming in. So you either have to make repression much worse or you have to relax. You can't remain the same. Uh, that choice could divide China's elite. We could see a very different China in the future and Western foreign policies ought to, ought to be ready for that. That shouldn't lock in one mentality the way they are. Things could get a lot worse, they could get a lot better. Um, we could see a mammoth succession struggle five years from now. Yeah. Uh, where do I come out on whether China will uh, grow more slowly than the US? Well, I'm confident in my arguments that China will grow much more slowly than today. This potential growth will be something like US. If you look at the other Asian miracle economies, South Korea, Taiwan, so on, they go for 10% 10 for 2025 years, 7% for a few years, level off at three. China's potential is that three minus Xi Jinping. Uh, China could change. Uh, whether it's slower or faster than the U.S. depends on the U.S. Uh, will the U.S. be a stable place? Will it have uh, solid, competent management? Uh, on the basis of the Trump-Biden era, I think it would be very difficult uh, to predict that. So, so I won't give you a confident prediction about who will grow faster 2030 to 2050. Thank you. Bill, thank you for um, an intriguing presentation. Um, let me pose a couple of questions, um, if I could. Uh, uh, if I could. Um, maybe the first is a sort of big picture question. If you were the United States, um, we can probably stipulate, and it's a subject for a different day, that the United States should pursue an agenda of domestic strengthening on a whole set of dimensions, but the content of that agenda is not for this is not for this day. But there is a question as to what should be the contours of uh, U.S. Uh, policy. I think it's prepared. I think it's fair to say that there's a growing consensus in favor of a policy that treats China as an adversary that seeks across multiple range of issues to confront and challenge uh, China that sees um, isolating China with respect to technology as important for our leader for our continued uh, leadership, and that is more focused on our imperatives of maintaining preeminence than of accommodating gracefully their desire for a peaceful rise. Um, if you were advising the U.S. government on 
the contours of China policy looking out five years, it's probably as far out as one can look. Um, what would your advice, uh, what would your advice be? And maybe you should precede your answer by giving a grade to um, U.S. policy as you understand it to be during the Biden administration. D plus. D plus. Um, I learned this morning, um, I learned this morning that um, in Harvard core courses, in large Harvard gen ed courses, precisely 4% of the grades are B or lower. So D plus, think about that. It's actually kind of shocking what I just told you. And I would argue not irrelevant to um, concerns about America. But in that context, uh, speaking in the Harvard community, D plus is a rather strong, uh, uh, strong statement. Uh, one of my children once received a D plus and um, reacted by saying, given the D, they thought the plus was a, bad, was a kind of injury, that it was a little bit like giving a tip to a waiter of 2% of uh, the bill. So D plus has a certain strong resonance, but um, what, uh, what leads you to assign the D plus and what would you do to make it better? Well, um, Trump gets a D, uh, uh, no plus. Uh, you've asked a big question. So let me step back. How do we win the Cold War? We focused on growing our economy and creating a system where friends and allies around the world uh, participated in an enormous takeoff of human welfare. The Soviet Union put all its money into the military. Uh, I know the opposite strategy. By the way, I give a a briefing to the National Security Council in May of 1977, arguing that, that the Soviet Union's uh, economy was destined for an actual collapse. Uh, uh, the Soviet guys hated me. Brzezinski said, you're right, but, but I'm not gonna public endorse, publicly endorse that policy. But I, actually the first, answer your question is if I were advising the US government, I'd lose my job within the first week. Um, uh, what's happened in the Trump-Biden era, uh, and Biden has just expanded on Trump's policies, uh, is that we've turned inward. Uh, we want everybody to join economic alliances with us, but we're not gonna give anything. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna give access to our market. And, uh, and we've done things that are very harmful to our own economy and doing that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, China got the message of the Cold War. What's Belt and Road? It's an institution, a collection of institutions that work like the World Bank, building infrastructure around the world. It's a set of institutions that uh, sets common standards. Uh, they promote uh, freer trade and investment around the world. Now, obviously China's got its pretty severe limitations, but it got the message it's doing it's trying to do what succeeded for us in the Cold War, and we've forgotten. Our foreign policy is, is military. Uh, and, 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 and so that's, that's the big picture. And Biden's protectionism is gonna, gives up the possibility of having the kind of global success and admiration and cooperation that we had 
during the Cold War. Now, on, on China policy in particular, the right thing to do is that when a company like Huawei comes along, or the, the battery company, CATL, uh, they get access to, originally to the whole world market. China, Europe, Japan, the US. And Western companies only get access to a tiny slice of the Chinese market. So Huawei grows so big that there's no way the Europeans can co compete. They just get wiped off the map. That's what's gonna happen in batteries. The right thing to do is every time that happens, you get together with the Europeans and the Japanese and you shut them down. The way we partially shut down Toyota when the Japanese were being behaving that way. And if China changes its policies and, and allows fair competition, then we do what we did with Toyota. Half the professors drive Toyotas and love it. Uh, it's targeted. It's not made up national security restrictions on steel and aluminum. That's lying. It's not even bending the rules, it's lying. Uh, that was started under Trump. Biden has just expanded that. It's in, what he's done is enormously damaging. Uh, you look at the, the restrictions on, on uh, solar panels. We are never gonna be a big maker of solar panels. There's no universe in which that happens. Uh, keeping Chinese solar panels out, uh, uh, last estimate I saw costs about 40,000 American jobs and it slows down the transition to new energy. You know, shooting ourselves in the foot. Now, how about, how about China policy more narrowly? This restriction on semiconductors is a declaration of economic war. It's completely disproportionate to any of the problems we have with China. This is going 30, 40% of the way toward what we did with Japan and cutting off their oil before. Semiconductors are the key to the modern world. This validates every crazy nationalistic Chinese professor who's been arguing that our goal all along has been to keep China down, to prevent them from growing. In terms of the relationship, it's just awful. It's an escalation. It's something, it's the first time we've done something that we probably can never turn back from. People don't realize this is a declaration of war. It's going to damage the American semiconductor industry. You notice what happened recently. Washington offered $52 billion worth of subsidies to our semiconductor industry, and the stocks all tanked. They're looking at 15,000 to 40,000 layoffs. And what's going to happen on the Chinese side? In China, industrial policy has a switch. So one is business as usual. Now Barry Naughton at University of California, San Diego, has a wonderful organization chart of how the government subsidies get to the final users. The organization chart looks like this. Um, Barry doesn't, Barry's a good professor. He doesn't draw immediate conclusions from that. I do. That's where $150 billion went to the Chinese semiconductor industry and they didn't, they didn't catch up an inch. The other switch, emergency important 
The nation depends on this space program. You clear out the local interests, you clear out seniority, you clear out party politics, you hire the best people, you pay them whatever it takes, you bring in whatever expertise you need anywhere in the world, and you build one hell of a program very fast. I think Biden's sanctions will do that. Now, back to the bigger picture. In China policy, Biden has done two important things. One is he has completely reneged on the 1979 agreement that's been the basis for peace in Taiwan. What did we say in that agreement? That we will not have official relations, we will not have an alliance. Now, Biden has said four times it will defend Taiwan. That's called an alliance. When Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, she was very careful to label it an official visit. And then immediately after the meeting with Chai Ing-wen, Chai Ing-wen's uh, spokesman, spokeswoman, went on their national TV and said, Taiwan is a sovereign and independent country. That was the celebration of Pelosi's visit. China has honored the agreement. We have broken the agreement. People in Washington, like Elbridge Colbury, don't remember that every, all the peace and prosperity and democracy in Taiwan are built on that 1979 agreement. Every time we send another congressional delegation and the Chinese protest by sending some airplanes and ships, we say all oh, those terrible, aggressive Chinese. We are the problem. And Biden has more explicitly than anybody else repudiated that deal. The Washington dynamic around Taiwan is that the admirals testify in Congress saying five years, China could win a war. And the interpretation that's been in five years, China intends to attack Taiwan. Well, intent and capability, two, two different things. Every intelligence officer and retired intelligence officer I've heard has said there is no indication of Chinese intent to invade Taiwan. We are creating the problem that we think we're trying to deter. You put that together with this declaration of economic war. And the reason for the D plus is I think, I think this towers over George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq. I think it towers over Lyndon Johnson's decision to escalate in Vietnam as a mistake. We won't see the consequences of that mistake for years. <coughs> I hope that somebody, and it won't be one of the current Republicans and it won't be Biden, and it re requires some, some responsiveness on the Chinese side, it's not irreversible. But this is potentially catastrophic. Sorry for a long answer, but you asked, you asked a big question. I did. There are quite there. We're, we don't have much more time, but if you want to have another question, go to the mic because there are people at, on Zooms. <coughs> I just poured water right down the wrong pipe. <coughs> Why don't we take a couple of questions and then answer them as a group? <coughs> Thank you very much for the for the lecture. I thought it was very balanced and provided a quite a unique perspective on the U.S. Chinese relations. My name is Alexander. I'm a MPP student here from Serbia. Uh, one question, one two things actually. At the beginning, you said the autocracies have a tendency not to be able to plan long term. Could you elaborate on that? Because it seemed, at least to me, counterintuitive. 
And the second thing is, how do you see the U.S.-Chinese relations play out in Africa? Thank you. Yes. Hi, Mauricio, MPID in the second year. Um, I was wondering where this consensus in poly, like bipartisan consensus towards policy in China coming from, why we don't see shifts in the policy? Because you talk about Biden's actions being like an expansion of Trump. Why don't we see a change with administrations? That's my question. One more. Yes. Thank you, professors. Uh, a simple question. So the first one is, uh, um, uh, what are the three things that the U.S. are most mad about China? And the second is, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, what are three things that you think, in your opinion, uh, the United States is most uh, mad uh, at China? And the other question is, uh, um, how do you see the prospect of uh, U.S. Uh, switching its uh, um, strategy of defining U.S.-China relationship as uh, uh, strategic competitors to one that is featured by things like uh, responsible stakeholders or uh, constructive partners. Thank you. Uh, the first question was about autocracy and its inability to do long term planning. Uh, unfortunately, I could do an hour and a half on this. The the most effective long-term plans that we have seen in modern history are Lee Kuan Yew's aut autocracy in Singapore, uh, Zhang Jingwo's autocracy in Taiwan, uh, Park Chung Hee's autocracy in, uh, in South Korea, and Jiang Zemin's autocracy in China. Just look at those networks of wonderful railroads and roads and dams, and, uh, telecommunications that go everywhere, which we Americans don't have. Where does this come from? I mentioned the, the series of problems. Now the people that lead to this, these conclusions, um, autocracies can't hire good people, they can't long-term planning. Uh, the famous professors at Harvard, MIT, and University of California, San Diego, who said uh, they compare democracies and autocracies. Now, what are autocracies? Uh, it's a wonderful political epithet, but autocracies are Singapore and Somalia. They're disintegrating Soviet Union and uh, Jiang Jingguo's Taiwan and, and the Republic of the Congo and Maduro's Venezuela. Uh, and when they compare those two groups, I say, well, the autocracies as a group don't do long-term planning well. They, they're, they're very dependent on fa factional hiring. So you start with the concept of autocracy, which is completely incoherent. Aristotle knew how to define systems that share some common structure and some common dynamic, four kinds of democracies and four kinds of, of uh, oligarchies and four kinds of dictatorships. This concept uh, in modern political economy of autocracies is just an ideological epithet. It has no analytical value. Uh, and, and look, at, look at the logic. Uh, you can do this with anything and get the result you want. Uh, so yeah, I like eggplants. So I hypothesize that eggplants are tastier than non-eggplants. Well, there are a lot of yucky things out there in the world. There are enough yucky things so that argument will work. Uh, it, 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 the next chain in, in, the, in the argument that that means chocolate cake is not tasty like eggplants. China, since China is an autocracy, it can't do long-term planning, uh, is the second fallacy. 
Uh, and I could go on, uh, but this, this stuff is the most famous stuff in modern political economy. It's a discipline going completely awry. Uh, that's, that's my initial rant. Uh, China and Africa. Uh, China has caused a lot of problems in Africa. It's done a lot more good. Uh, African growth since China started growing has gone from a zero to two range to the two to six range. Uh, and, and an awful lot of that has to do with Chinese demand, uh, with Chinese investment, with Chinese railroads, with Chinese roads, uh, with Chinese telecommunications. Uh, yes, there are debt problems. Uh, China's where our companies were in the 60s. Uh, they're learning. Uh, they're where Japan's companies were in the 60s. And we had a big problem with Japan. Exactly the same problems we're having with China now in Africa. And the, 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 the Chinese learning curve tracks the Japanese learning curve perfectly. And African countries' problems with Western debt are a lot bigger than African problems with Chinese debt. And China has been handling the debt in an utterly responsible way. Uh, Deborah Brodigam at, at, at SAIS did a, a study of 1,100 uh, Chinese uh, financial deals, many of which have come under pressure. They have never once called in collateral. They've never once said, well, since you owe me money that I can't pay, I'm going to seize your road, your port. Uh, and, and I, I have to say, it, it, it's one of the most troubling things to me, that particularly under the Republicans, but also uh, under Biden, Mr. Blinken in particular, have pushed this utterly false Chinese debt trap argument. Uh, so China's done a lot of good for Africa. Uh, uh, you can shut me off when it's time. Uh, we're getting there. I th you People can stay around, but I think we're getting near the end of the hour. But answer just answer one last thing. Okay, what are the three biggest problems we, we have with China? They take the privileges that they, and before them Japan, and before them Taiwan, South Korea got as a, a, an impoverished developing country. And they insist on retaining those privileges as a giant superpower. Uh, that's the summary. So we allow a lot of intellectual property theft. India's still doing it. Uh, but when you're the same size as our economy, when it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year, it's unacceptable. When when you're Huawei and you're not you're not a little tiny company in a in an impoverished uh, country that deserves some special privileges, instead you're just going to wipe out all the global competition. It's predatory. It's not. And, and it's the same thing. Of, okay, we're a country that was invaded over a century by the Europeans and the Japanese. We're a victim. So we're going to build a navy and protect ourselves. But that becomes taking over everybody else's stuff. Even, even pieces of Bhutan are, are being bitten off. And we have our traditional Chinese rights, but nobody else has any traditional fishing rights or territorial rights or anything. And our subsidized fishermen were very poor and needed help. And now people are starving everywhere because of Chinese fishing predation. These guys are trained as militia 
catches off North Korea, went down 70%. The, the Japanese find these, what they call ghost boats. It's a, these North Korean boats full of dead sailors from North Korea. Chinese have taken all the fish off the coast of Africa and along the coast of India. Uh, the local fishermen are malnourished, often on the verge of starvation. Uh, this is this incredible subsidized Chinese fishing fleet. China says we're a superpower, but we're also a victim. We're a developing country, and that's, that's part of every Chinese major foreign policy speech. But we're a superpower, we're gonna, create a community of common destiny for the world. Uh, I call this problem of an adolescent, an adolescent power. On the economic side, we went through this with the Japanese. It got pretty rough with Japan. We, we put 10% tariffs on everything. We put quotas on their cars. We put quotas on lots of things. Uh, and finally, the, the Japanese realized if we're going to play in the big league, we got to play by the rules. Some rules. Where the U.S. falls back, we don't most of the time invite China to participate in making the rules. And we have an obligation to do that. But China has become a predatory power that says, we're a victim. We have the right to take all the, the Philippine fishing areas because we're a historical victim of the Europeans. Well, that's, that's the umbrella problem. I'll stop there. Bill, I'm gonna just state what are the three most important things that I learned uh, from your uh, presentation or was reminded of. You may think I got them right, but I'm the moderator. I got them wrong, but I'm the moderator. So I'm gonna take the last word and then leave you to remain here to discuss these matters uh, with, uh, with people. Everybody at the Kennedy School has read Graham Allison's book about uh, essence of decision. And it has a central lesson for national security policy, which is that states are not monolithic actors. And if you wanna understand why they do what they do, you have to think a great deal about the internal political dynamics within them. And your analysis about Xi Jinping's challenge of taking on all the obstacles to progress as he defined progress at once, and that being a risky uh, strategy is I think crucial to understanding uh, some of the dynamics within China that are likely to unfold and are likely to be important as uh, we think about it. Second, um, yours is a powerful antidote to the kind of economics that we teach in economics courses. That is the economics of Adam Smith about competitive markets marred only occasionally by market failure. Yours is an economics of economic power defined by industries with uh, economies of scale with industries that aren't all the same. Uh, one of the best points that was ever made against uh, classical economics was made against the guy, by the guy who said, should America really be indifferent as to whether it's specializing in silicon chips or potato chips? And yours is a perspective that very much animates and picks that up and points to the threat to the United States. Um, from others who have a different philosophy. There is a kind of mercantilist version of the golden rule, which is he who has the gold rules. 
And uh, that is a perspective that you both ascribe to China and think very clearly about the consequences of. And the third thing I learned uh, from your presentation or was reminded of that, um, to put it in an unpleasant and colloqu but colloquial way, it's a mistake to become overly enamored of one's own bullshit. And uh, that we need to understand as Americans, even as we protest and explain our virtue, that some observer from on high would observe that we sometimes don't honor agreements, that our approaches are sometimes amoral and self-interested. And at a minimum, if we are going to succeed, we need to understand how others could form such a perception of us and that without clarity, without a willingness to look in mirrors unflinchingly, it is difficult uh, to look or act uh, wisely. And I think you do a very, very good job of uh, reminding us of uh, that as well. So thank you very much, Bill, for an extraordinarily stimulating presentation. Thank you.